Welcome to Orthopod, a podcast about the people of orthopedics and their stories. We understand that we all play many roles in our careers and lives, and it is these very stories that ultimately inform our successes and failures. Welcome to Orthopod. I am here with uh, Brad Petrozor. He's back again, and we're going to be chatting about evidence. Now, we're going to change it up a little bit in this particular segment because from time to time, there are topics that are of just general interest to the public, and we have one, I think, today that will be of interest. And there are also methodological issues that are arisen because of that. And Brad, I think we've been chatting before the camera went on about your take on how evidence is just, quote, thrown around. Yeah, I, I mean, I see a lot of it in other areas. We're going to talk about a, um, a study today. But um, in a lot of popular press areas, you get evidence um, just thrown out there. And it doesn't matter what kind of evidence it is. Do you know what I mean? Be it basic science, clinical, if it's a paper published in a journal, yeah. then it mean you know, this is the answer. And you see it, I'll be honest with you, you see it a lot in the nu- nutritional world. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's very polarizing things. So one study will come and say, X something is bad. Another study will say this is bad. But when you actually look at the studies, sometimes they're not applicable to the situation even. So I find that there's two, two issues. One is the issue of critically appraising something, but then the other is the issue of just not even having a sense of what types of studies, trials, things are published. You know what I mean? And some just may not have be but applicable. He, but here's the problem. And that, it's just thrown out. Yeah, I get it. Here's the problem though. Um, and we're going to talk about Achilles tendon ruptures and injuries, largely because of uh, you know the recent recent media frenzy around uh, one particular basketball superstar, Kevin Durant, having an Achilles tendon in, Achilles tendon injury, and the debate and around um, quote experts talking about information. The problem I find is when they say, "Oh, a paper says" or right. "evidence suggests." They don't give any background to, well, is this trustworthy information? Where'd you get the information from? Is the quality of the paper, just because it's a, quote, basic science paper or a clinical trial doesn't mean it's going to make, you know, make a big shift in terms of our knowledge. So one thing I think might be helpful is just uh, for those of you who I suspect you've all heard of the evidence pyramid. But when we're talking about evidence today, you're going to hear us use terms like meta-analysis, randomized trial observational study and you know when we talk about this and I'm just going to move this over here and see if I can just draw you out something this is the pyramid we talk about so it kind of goes like this and really what we're saying is there's are different levels so there's a level in this particular case at the top a level one two three four and five so take a look at where you think the basis of quote opinion is right this is what we call basically opinion so public opinion, an expert opinion, or in this case, even a fundamental study. So when we talk about in the hierarchy of evidence, we're talking basic science work. Fundamental science would be sitting here at level five. Level four is the case series. And that series is, you know, as you know, a series of patients. Level three adds a control group. Level two is what we call the prospective study. And level one, where we're going to spend all our time on today, partly, is where we have the randomized clinical trial. And when you combine data from many randomized clinical trials, you can create something here called a meta-analysis. So we'll just put MA here. And a meta-analysis of randomized trials is the focus of today's discussion. One other thing you will notice, though, is that this particular meta-analysis that's very current, published in 2019, I'll get Dr. Petrozor to introduce it a bit, also also includes what we call the observational study design. All that means is it's the non-RCT design in which patients are allocated to treatment A or treatment B by some other method that's not random. So there's a potential selection bias in who gets into these studies. And we'll just call this OBS for now. So these are the two focuses of today, but you can see they are way higher than, you know, case series and expert opinion and even some of the basic science work that's been done, which is considered fundamental. Doesn't mean that it's not useful. It just means that it's so far away from application to general patient care that we have to be careful about extrapolating that. So is that kind of how I've capt- captured that, Brad? Absolutely. And yeah, one thing I just wanted to add for those listening is 
this is specific to a clinical application of evidence around a therapy. Correct. So a therapy or a treatment of some sort. We, the other thing that I hear a lot about is not an RCT because it's, therefore it's no good. It's not an RCT, it's no good. Observation. No, for sure. So sometimes it's not possible to do a randomized oh, control for sure. trial for many, many different things. So we have to bear that in mind. This hierarchy is very specific for clinical therapies and not other things such as studies of prognosis, studies of um, diagnosis, etc. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. so let's not always equate RCT with the only thing that can be yeah. done. Oftentimes it's not possible, but for the clinical trial of therapy, RCT would be considered the best. Right, and for today's discussion Correct. on Achilles tendon rupture, yeah. um, we're focusing on two big scopes of treatment. So yeah. operative or non-operative. Do you operate or don't you? And then ultimately, are there you know, various permutations of one procedure or another, like a, you know, accelerated rehab, these kind of protocols that ultimately make a difference. When you're looking for a ton of information, well, ideally having a high quality meta-analysis is probably the way to start. And then you can look at individual studies. But you know, in this particular case, as we'll see, there are going to be numerous methodological issues that would never really be raised if you just look at the conclusion. So maybe, Brad, you can introduce today's focus. And this is um, also the focus of an ortho evidence ACE report, advanced clinical evidence report. So for those of you who are interested in reading more about this, you can find it on ortho evidence and you'll see um, the topic there um, available to you. And we'll also be showing the actual original paper that was published in the British Medical Journal. So Brad, maybe you want to just give a quick yeah, so the preamble to this whole topic and then we'll get into the paper. The pre the background is that Achilles tendons can rupture. Achilles tendon is that uh, tendon complex that uh, is basically your calf musculature, gastroc soleus down and attaching to your calcaneus. So, um, and, and, and as, a, as a, a, another disclaimer, we're not promoting any one treatment here. <laughs> not at all. If you're listening to this and you've got an Achilles tendon rupture, talk to your provider about, about how you might want to go about treating it. However, that's a little disclaimer. But, yep. um, so Achilles tendons uh, can rupture and then the general history is you can either operate on them with a, a large incision or a small incision and put the two tendon ends together or you can not operate on them and uh, let it heal up on its own as long as the tendon ends can get together, um, which they will do uh, on their own with scar tissue, etc. So historically, um, the uh, if you operated on an Achilles tendon, it would have a slightly less tendency to rupture again. And that is really the big issue, isn't it? Like you've been talking about, issue. okay, so I'm gonna get this treated uh, and you wanna get out there. You don't wanna have that again because that's a right. massive event again. It's another, you're down for a period of time. Right. You may need another procedure or a long you know, period of prolonged uh, you know, non-operative treatment. So that's the big one, right? Right. So We're re-rupture is that. the big one. So the operative management would tend to, it would historically decrease the re-rupture rate to operative, non-operative management. But of course, you take the good with the bad. And if you have surgery, there's a risk of... Oh gosh, infection, infection of course. And uh, those sorts of problems. So surgical stuff had a higher complication rate. So you brought your re-rupture rate down. Yeah, 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 yeah but you increased your risk of infection and wound healing problems. Got and that's the issue. But so that's been the trade-off for probably, gosh, 17 years? Yeah. 16 years? I mean, so we've known this. So, okay, so that's right. this is what happens, right? NBA Finals, Kevin Durant, I'll use one example. There's many examples, but in a high-profile sports figure goes down and media goes frenzy. Every single, quote, blogger is out there talking about their perception of what this injury means. Mm -hmm. Did they lie? Did they not? Was it truly a partial tear? Did it become a full tear? All this sort of stuff happens. You, as someone who's working in a university environment, foot and ankle treatment, see these types of patients all the time. Maybe not the high, high, high athlete, but you're seeing all kinds of patients with traumatic injuries. And specifically, you've, you've managed lots of these injuries, uh, Achilles tendon. Yeah. You look for evidence. So what's your first thing? Like, so you would presumably go in, you type in, you'd say, okay, I'm going to look for a paper. Would the paper we're about to discuss be what you would say, okay, I want to get a pretty good sense of whether one works or another. Would this be a reasonable representation of a paper you would have pulled as being 
probably trustworthy in information? Yeah, this would have been, the paper that we're going to discuss would have been one that had come up within your sort of top 10, but we're doing slightly different searches than other people may do as well right. in terms right. of PubMed. So I'm using a clinical query search, I'm specifically yeah. searching a few terms, and then I'm specifically looking at reviews, yeah. systematic reviews. And that's what we're doing. Not yeah. narrative summaries, yeah. systematic reviews. Right. And so that will be a, a, a cumulative uh, evidence uh, repository within one study, looking and analyzing the data and meta-analyzing the data that is combining data from multiple randomized controlled trials, or in this case, both randomized controlled trials and observational studies. Right. Now, we just had a podcast not too long ago with a bunch of graduate students saying, well, we think you know the new case series has become the meta-analysis. And you know you can look at that kind of as being a bit facetious, but I think what we're saying is doing meta-analysis for the sake of meta-analysis of non-high quality studies, in this case, a bunch of case series, which just seems to be common, has become the new case series. You can't take a meta-analysis of non-comparative studies, pool them and say, oh my goodness, we have a level one, right? So that, the argument really there is not to say meta-analysis is not a useful tool, yeah. but in certain circumstances where there's high quality evidence, you can actually make some meaningful difference. Does it take away a large clinical trial? Absolutely not. Right. If you could do a big clinical trial if that's available, use it. Right. Most of the time, as we'll see in this example, it's just not there. Well, and the problem, the problem with the meta-analysis, if you don't actually look into the data, you're, you're pooling what's quote unquote high quality randomized controlled trials so that such that you say but when you actually look at some of them like you're saying they may not be the high quality okay or, so what or um, each individual trial may not sufficiently answer said question okay so why don't we get into this why don't we start off with the title so again this is published in the British Medical Journal uh, this past year and Brad this is what operative treatment versus non-operative treatment of Achilles tendon ruptures systematic review and meta-analysis right you can see the authors there, authors on screen, yeah. Yeah, and what I would recommend also is, let's just let's just take a quick look at the abstract. Everyone's gonna have time to read the abstract, right? So if you're reading the original paper, well, you're gonna read the OE ACE report, and that'll give you some information. But the abstract itself will give you a quick idea of what this paper is about. So in this particular paper, it starts off right off the bat by saying, they give what they're interested in. They're interested in two big things. Re-ruptures, which is a big issue, and we know that based on your clinical experience, mm -hmm. and what is the consequence and the complication profile associated with each of those different treatments. So you can argue if one treatment significantly reduces re-ruptures and has lower complications, that's it. You have a winner. The trade-off is going to be you know, on any other permutation of those findings. So that's pretty good. They do a systematic review of meta-analysis. We've talked about that. They talk about how they found the information, tons of detail, looks pretty good, Brad, you'd probably say that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. And then they go right into, you know, you know, what they want. So they've decided to do something a bit unique, not typical, but people do it, is they've added beyond randomized clinical trials, a non-clinical trial data set, which in this case could be level two evidence. Um, so level one is randomized trials. The purists, think you'd agree would say well you know if you have RCT data and enough of it why do you need to go to observational studies Correct. they will talk about it and we'll we'll have a little discussion about what you think okay. about uh, that particular concept okay so keep going down and the thing that immediately struck me with this particular paper is they had 29 studies included of which only six percent 6% represent the highest quality data set. Now within that 6% that are randomized clinical trials, there's still gonna be gradient of quality. Right. So right off the bat, um, you know, and this is a highly reputable journal, this is a good group of authors, they understand the methodology clearly. This just gets back to the broader issues of when we're trying to understand what works and what doesn't. And to you know, papers that have said, can we believe any research we read? When you see that, how does that strike you? Like, so you haven't even read the results. You right. just know that only a small fraction, probably right. three or four percent, really, of, yeah. is going to represent high quality data. The majority of it is going to be. Now, you can argue whether a observational study is low quality. I'm not saying absolutely low, but it's right. definitely lower right. than a high quality RCT. Yeah, and and mainly because there's uh, potentially a, in observational studies, if we pool observational studies, a lack of comparison within the same study, right. oftentimes, because right. they're not all going to be that observational prospective oh, yeah. uh, cohort. For sure. So. For sure. So yeah, that strikes me as being, well, all of the data 
the vast majority of data that we know in 2019 about Achilles tendon ruptures that we've been arguing about for 20 years as an orthopedic community or longer, and you only have 6% of your patient population in randomized trial. Okay, so what they do and say, yeah, yeah. the randomized trials don't all have the same operative treatment group. Oh gosh, it's a lot of all yeah, yeah. Like so we're getting into some very mixed. muddy waters immediately. Right. Then they go on to say, well, at the end of the day, you know, the actual difference, while significantly reduced with operative treatment, is statistically all, significant. Statistically reduced. significant. Really, if you look at the actual numbers, not huge, right? I mean, we're talking about in this particular case, you know, a few percent absolute difference between one group and another, and the risk of reoperation in the non-operative group is about three percent or so, I think. Yeah. Is that right. So yeah. let's let's three point nine. That yeah, three point nine percent. So that's that's the risk of having a re-rupture if you get non-operative treatment, you can reduce that by a percentage or so, you can see here, if you get operative treatment. So yes, it looks like it's significant, but the question is ultimately going to be, is that an important enough difference for most people? Right, but here's the kicker, and this is where it comes down to the whole, how do you present your results, and how do we interpret our results? So non-operative treatment is 3.9% yep. absolute re-rupture yep. rate, Correct. and the absolute re-rupture rate in operative treatment is 2.3%. Yep. If you gave those numbers to anybody, they'd say, oh, okay, well, that's 1% difference. Yeah, they're the same. But when you look at your risk ratio of a 0.4, so a 60% reduction in your risk of re-rupture, right. all of a sudden our perception of what our re-rupture rate is, oh, you mean I can have my re-rupture rate? Oh, that's it. So th that's the whole the, the whole other crux of this is how do you present this data to oh, people yeah, yeah. such sure. that we can take that in and say yeah because so based on this just based yeah. on this you've got that you've also says here that there's also a an increase right mm -hmm. in complications so higher risk of infections right. with operative treatment and then they, at, they end it by saying, well, we find that there's o o overall, overall, right, that we didn't find any other difference between how you rehabbed or anything else you did that would make operative look better or worse. So basically, overall, we think there's no difference between the two treatments, ultimately is what they're saying. Ultimately is what they're yeah. saying. When you look at that paper, um, what are you gonna look for now? Like, are you convinced? Okay, well, you know, assuming that's a good reflection of the overall paper, what are you left thinking after this? No, is it, should you have operated uh, on an acute uh, sports injury? Should you not have operated? What, what would be the benefit, if any? Right. Um, so a lot of people are going to finish reading this at the abstract. Right. And so what I want to look at now is, okay, let's dig into a little bit of well, what are these papers? What uh, what does the data actually look like? Right. Um, how skewed is it? Are these papers reflecting? Are these randomized trials asking a similar question? Are they having yeah. a similar patient population? Right. You know, are they actually reflective and all sort of saying the same thing, just not quite there? Or are they saying different things? And those are things that you need to look at the data for, the pooled estimates of effect yeah. in the forest plots and things like that. That's what I would go to. Yeah, but right now, if you had to decide whether you would operate or not based on this paper, the most recent, the most comprehensive, large meta-analysis and systematic review, would you be left feeling more compelled to operate or less compelled less to operate? Compelled. Okay, so why don't we start digging deeper into the paper and what I've done, um, as I take a look at the paper, and I've just highlighted sections that we'll put up on the screen for you, and then hopefully Dr. Prechazor uh, and I can have a discussion. Now, these some of them are based on the actual findings, and some of them are just based on just general issues with the conduct of research, and trying to help you know some of you, and also some of you know have a debate around some of these issues. So the first issue that comes up is a section in the introduction that gives the reason for why we want to do, or why this additional meta-analysis was done. And they make a point, I don't know, I, I wonder if Brad, if you can read that out. Sure, so a recent systematic review of overlapping meta-analyses evaluated nine meta-analyses. So there's nine meta-analyses and systematic reviews that compared operative and non-op treatment. The discordance found among the nine meta-analyses indicated that further investigation is warranted as rehab protocols, weight-bearing restrictions, and treatment modalities have evolved. Meaning the studies, the later studies, the ones closer to 2019 have evolved such that there is a significant difference between the way people are treated, the operative techniques, and the rehab as to the earlier studies. And thus they felt they needed to do another 
meta-analyses. And I always say that if you have nine, remember, nine meta-analyses represents, in this particular case, some 30-odd studies right. and many, many randomized trials over the years. Because two or three or four or five, or in this case, nine prior systematic review meta-analyses don't agree, hey, let's do another one, right? right? <laughs> and the question is, if you decide to jump in and do another one, it needs, my perspective, should be what are they bringing new to the table that is going to be particularly useful? So my immediately, my gut feeling is, okay, when we look back at this, are we going to get a result that's either more precise because there's so much new data, or there's going to be much, much more clarity in the data that's going to be presented because different outcomes are being used or different right. techniques. That would make sense. But I will ask you, Brad, if you can minimize and go to um, a prior study that we were involved in back in clinical orthopedics and related research, 2002. And Brad, I'd like to ask you to read that conclusion that we had back in 2002. Surgical treatment significantly reduces the risk of Achilles tendon re-rupture, but increases the risk of infection when compared with conservative or non-operative therapy. There you go. So I want to keep that in your mind as we think about, okay, when we look at this paper, are we any realistically further ahead from what we knew back in 2002? And this gets to the point of multiple papers coming out, creating all kinds of, quote, discordance. And we'll see, in fact, if this paper gives us new insights to what we seem to have known back in 2002. So we'll go back to this paper and we'll keep flipping down. And I wanted to keep going down to the next highlighted section for you. And, you'll, and I'll get you to read that out once we get to it. And again, keeping in mind that we're focusing on areas that we believe are, are going to be of interest uh, to you as we discuss them because they come up all the time. So if we stop here, just even at, and I know you want to talk about it, at the well, one of the tables. This table discusses re-rupture rates. Right. So tell me about... Um, your interpretation of that particular table, and maybe we can highlight some areas that might be unclear to some of the uh, viewers. Well, for me, this is the 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 table um, that tells the story. So, for those of you <coughs> who uh, th this is a forest plot of all the data. So, each one of these are the randomized controlled trials that are included in the systematic review. And what I want you to, to really look at is the numbers here. And look at each of these trials. So we have operative group 56 to 55, 39 to 41, 32 to 28. So what's the first thing that we see? The first thing that we see is each trial is very, very small yeah. compared to what you always talk about in terms of big trials and right. numbers. And John Ianudis, in a paper that right. came out in 2005, warned us against the problem with small studies because right. they are more likely to be false than they are correct. Right. And I, I, I want to bring this up because this is something I've had a few... I've had a few uh, uh, sort of aha, to, to not to overuse a phrase, moments um, in listening to people like Gordon Guy, yes. PJ Devereaux, Victor right. Montori, yeah. etc. And this was one of them. Right. Why are these studies always wrong? Why are we always arguing with each other? And PJ, I remember him very specifically said, what are we doing as researchers? We're trying to understand what the truth is. Yes. There's lots of argument about different things and, and who really wants to understand the truth, etc. But at the end of the day, if we right. take it purely, yeah. we want to know what the truth is. Right. And so what are the two things pushing us away from the truth? And this hit home to me. Number one is bias. Yep. And that is a systematic tendency to deviate from the truth. Yep. Something we, and there's multiple biases, selection bias, this bias, oh, that yeah. bias. But the overall concept is something is pushing you away from the truth. Yep. But the other one, the less talked about one, is chance. Right. And the thing that strikes me the most is that if you think about the world, there are seven billion people yeah. in the world. Each, unless you're identical twin, so genetically different that we can tell each other apart just by looking at seven billion people. Right. And what we're saying is, you know what? I'm going to take a hundred and I'm going to study them. And maybe I'll take another hundred and another hundred. What are the chances that we're just wrong? Right. And the chances are, when you think about it that way, huge. Yeah. Oh, I <laughs> you get know, it. just on the surface of it. it. I get so it. when we look at that well, here. table. So, so I'm going to add to your point, right? So I'm going to take that point, what you just said is, if we have a study 
like this, right? And this is the timeline going forward, right? right. Start a study. Over time, as sample size or sample size gets bigger, you're gonna see this happening, right? Yeah. Like Collins, big waves, big yeah. waves, and eventually the truth may be this, right? right. But if, if when you have a small study, you can go anywhere from believing something works to believing it doesn't work, right. or having no idea. Where the truth may be that it works, it may be. But when you are small, you can have all kinds of swings. And these right. swings are very, very, very typical of small right. studies because they represent this wide, wide confidence interval, which right. is really what we're talking about here, right? Which is that dot. But you've illustrated it beautifully. Just this like is an that. imprecise effect. Oh, for sure. And this is a precise effect. Right. And the truth is, when you have that dot, right, this is, this is what the study found. The truth is, it can be anywhere from here Yep. Anywhere from here. So anything right. from a strongly positive to a strongly negative study, anywhere right. you want, it can be completely in that point. Right. And we're playing with that when we're talking about small studies. Now, Mo, how many times have you seen if, yeah. if a study, I'm going to do it this way. If yeah. this is the confidence limit, this is a treatment effect, yep. this is the confidence, this is the line of no effect. Yeah. How many times have you seen the study finish off with a result here or finish oh. off with a result here? Absolutely. So I'll, give, so I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example right now of a study that is not atypical to look like this. Okay, so this again is the thing of there's no difference here, right? And we'll say in this case it's favoring, let, let's, say, let's say this case favors operative, Yeah. right? So this is favoring operative and this is against operative. Okay. You can start off very easily with small studies as an example looking like this, right? Big, big wide studies and over time as you add more and more data, you can start seeing things. And if you pulled it at, at small numbers of patients, you wouldn't know. And eventually, eventually, the truth with this one here is, it can be non-operative is better or operative is way better. But right now the study said, ah, it doesn't look like there's a difference. You add thousands and thousands of patients of data in, and you can easily end up somewhere down here, right? And it, in the, But here's the point. As you keep going down, and you keep going down, we don't usually find out the truth or better sense, take a guess how many patients it usually takes. To find? Yeah. Um, a couple hundred, 500. Thousand. Thousand. But a thousand. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about studies that are, in this particular case, small, and if you look at this particular table, the total number of data they have for randomized clinical trials is about total data set is about a thousand patients, roughly, right? right? You know, about 450, but you know, just under a thousand. So we're getting into, we're getting into that area where, you know, we should start being thinking that that estimate of treatment effect may be a reasonable estimate and may be reasonably precise. Right. However, right. is it based upon high quality randomized trials, which is right. your point. And if they're small, are, are you taking a bunch of imprecise, small randomized trials and thinking, oh, We'll just pull them and we're gonna have a precise estimate. Yeah, but are you ultimately gaining the truth from that? It, would a single large trial of a thousand patients come up with the same answer is the question. And 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 that is a question that we cannot answer from this data. And, and so notice though, when you look at this, we haven't even critically appraised these randomized control trials no, yet. No, not yet. And so when you look at them, this brings up the first point, number one, not one of them answered the question. Ex there was one, one, two, three, four, five. Mueller's study in 2001 was the only one that was statistically significant. Right. right? Now, that doesn't even bring in the concept of, of uh, clinical significance, number one. Number two, this brings up, this illustrates PJ Devereaux's and others' point about the fragility of studies beautifully. When you look at the actual, you know, a lot of people argue it's not the sample size per se, it's the number of events. When you look at these events, the standard event rate is from two to five, or sometimes two and one, or two and three. We all know that follow up for most of these, we can make this assumption fairly, um, well, I think we can make it, is that not all of these trials had 100% follow-up. That's a safe assumption, do you feel? Yes, agreed. Right. Okay, so for the sake of one event, for the sake of one event can change the whole face of the trial. Oh, absolutely, and, and if you look at this, like so just going back to the screen here, you've just articulated why a meta-analysis is so powerful, right. is that you've taken four studies 
Now, we'll use an example of four studies, but there's many more here. Then let's say a randomized clinical trials. Each of them suggests, right? Because this trial, if you read independently, and if you read the individual paper, what would that have said? It would have said, well, there's no difference between surgery and no surgery. Why? Because the confidence interval crosses one, which means that it's not, it's possible that it's better, but we don't know. By the way, there's four more studies like that, exactly like that. And that's what that table or that figure shows you. Right. But here's the power. As soon as you go and say, let's combine them as if it was a single study, suddenly now we have a result that said, hey, look, we just took four studies that showed there's no difference. But when we combine them, whoa, operative treatment is better. And that becomes the whole power of increased precision. Why? Because when you add sample size, you narrow the confidence interval. That's all we've done here. Mm -hmm. The question now becomes is, are these similar enough? Right. Are they believable enough? And is a small study of 50 patients you know, done 50 times or right. 10 times going to be as valuable as a single large study? So if we don't have a single large study, you could say, well, you know what? I don't believe any of this. But right. then that's not really going to be a fruitful way to, you know, to, to practice because you need to have some information. But that's the crux of this, isn't it? Yeah, 100%. And, uh I just completely lost my train of thought. No, no, but, but, but you were getting to the concept of fragility. So each yeah. of these paper studies is fragile. Fragile meaning for one the or, sake of one event. One, one, one treatment event right. going one way or the other can completely change the results of these studies. Right. That is a big problem. And correct me if I'm wrong, Mo. I mean, you know way more about this than me. In terms of the original derivation of a systematic review in internal medicine, right. they were already dealing with randomized trials in the order of hundreds to thousands of patients Correct. Well, I would say I would say that when you've seen uh, meta analysis that have changed practice yeah. in medicine, they have typically been you know uh, large large studies like already that, in the beginning. Like so, their primary data set was fairly large. Like especially when I think of the medicine. original streptokinase studies or the right. clot busting studies. Where, you know, at the end of the day, the meta analysis are dealing with forty thousand patients who've been randomized right. over the course of several trials. Correct. And we're dealing with. 400 and 400, 469 and 475. But that gets back to the whole patient is when is when, when do we have enough data right. to make a decision? And quite frankly, are we still in this play of chance? But let's keep going because I think I think it's instructive I, to keep this in the back of your mind. And, and I want to point out one thing. We have raised doubt with this meta-analysis and the final result without even critically appraising the study, Agreed. number one, Agreed. so we don't know, Agreed. and number two, um, not to mention what you've talked about is the is the, the mixture of what the actual treatments were within each study. No, no, so there's yeah. a whole host of things. So yeah. so this illustrates clearly why why would we have doubt when we have, you know, as an outsider who say, well, you've got 10 randomized trials, why would yeah. there be that's exactly why we have right. doubt. Yeah, absolutely. And you should be cautious about the interpretation. If you scroll down and you see the other section, which is the observational study. So this is the level two evidence. Or lower. Or lower. Right. They make a statement there and say, look at the look at the treatment effect. It's kind of giving the exact same answer, a little bit more heterogeneity, which means the study's a little bit looking a bit more different. But pretty well the same in terms of the estimate. It's like one is 0.4, one is 0.42. It's almost bang on. And I think that's the argument they say. They say, if you find non-RCTs that are similar in effect, well, boy, you should pull that data. So they've come up with that. It just turned out. Now, I can guarantee you, had this shown some very, very, very positive effect, like str even stronger than that, like a, uh, a relative risk of 0.2 or something, which would be an 80% reduction in the risk of reoperation. There would be all kinds of issues with pulling that data because they'd say, ah, you know, we know this. Randomized trials are often more conservative in terms of what they say. If you do a big trial, you're more likely to find no difference than a big one because small trials to find a difference have to be big. Mm -hmm. And so in this particular case, there's a sense of, ah, maybe they're overestimating. They're making the argument quite opposite now that's saying, you can actually pull these two data sets because you know, a well done observational study is as valuable and as powerful as a clinical trial. That's the statement, I think, which makes right. this more novel than other areas. Yeah, but it's very interesting when you look at the observational study data set. If you look at Wang et al. 2015 that, that contributed, what, 12,000 patients? That's driving our data by that's 20% of the effect Correct. based on one trial. So Correct. that speaks Correct. to the Correct. size. Correct. And I, I think what you're, I, I'm thinking, I reflect back to your issue about the case series and the observational stuff. 
when you have huge numbers, right. you can get fantastic data from that sure prospectively can. gathered question. So when I, you know, um, and that's when those observational slash case series cohorts play a huge role. When the numbers are so huge that you can get um, rare things that you wouldn't see, and so you okay. know that's driving that. So let's keep scrolling down, and, to, and 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 if we can get down to the next uh, highlighted section, I want to just quickly get your take on. We keep going down. Highlight, highlight, highlight. I would have highlighted a few. Here there we go. go. Okay, so if you could take a look at that and then just put that in context. Yeah. So previous meta analysis reported a risk difference in re-rupture rate varying from five to seven percent. So the risk difference would either be five percent or seven percent, depending, and a risk difference of other complications varying from sixteen to twenty-one. So what they're saying is prior studies, you know, were saying that re-rupture rates are pretty high. Right. And you know, and if they are six or seven percent, that's that's enough to start really taking a taking a look at. And complication rates are high too with surgery. And that's right. another reason you should be taking a look at it. Right. But they found something different. With the addition of observational studies, this review shows that those differences between treatment groups are smaller. Risk difference in re-rupture rate of one point six percent and a risk difference of three point three percent for other complications. So I think the crux of this paper's novelty is basically saying, hey, listen. We added observational studies. We know you shouldn't, in the past, people would be against it because they have different estimates. We found almost the identical estimates of treatment effect, so we decided to include them. And by the way, when we include them, we have much more precise estimates on the overall re-rupture rate. And by the way, it's not such a big deal, quote. Right. And maybe that becomes the crux of saying, it doesn't really matter if you operate or not because the overall risk of having a reoperation is sufficiently low, it probably doesn't matter. That seems to me what they're saying. Is that your interpretation? Yeah, that's, that would be my interpretation. So while we finish off in the last few sections, I thought were worthy of discussion, because this is where, like in the discussion of the paper, rounds it all out. Now, many of you aren't gonna spend a lot of time on the discussion, but we're just gonna deep dive into this as we have been, because right. it's such an important area and it seems so topical. But Brad, why don't you maybe discuss your understanding of this, of how they frame this for the implications for future research? Uh, for the implications, well, well for the implications of future research, well, let, let, my, let, let me just read what they've got there. Okay, and okay, we can okay. Go to that. Sure. So, non so the, the final implications for future research on that paragraph is non-operative treatment might be the preferred treatment for acute Achilles tendon rupture, owing to the higher risk of other complications after operative treatment and the relatively small benefit in re-rupture rate. Okay. So, so, so we take that statement back from our original paper back in 2002, and I said, oh, well, what's this going to sign different? Looks like the big difference is their estimates of reoperation or re rupture are just lower, and therefore right. the relative effect is going to be smaller. In other words, they're not saying that, they're saying exactly what other st studies said in the past, which is ah, significant reduction in re rupture rate with operative treatment, more complications. Yeah. Exactly what was said in 2002. Right. The difference is the overall absolute differences are probably smaller, so right. you can decide whether that risk and that uh, improvement is, is good enough, right? right. So therefore, that's what they find. This, this paper really is a paper promoting non-treatment, yeah. non-operative treatment. Yeah. Would you agree? I would totally agree. Yeah. I mean, the, because they're presented it as a risk difference yeah. as opposed to risk yeah, ratios. Yeah, the whole argument you, for the paper. If you want to if you want to steer someone, you'd be presenting the risk ratios and saying there's a 60% oh, yeah. reduction in risk. Yeah, yeah, no. They say no. Your risk is 2.3% yeah. yeah. of re-rupture in an operative group versus 39 Okay, in so we're all in agreement. This paper uh, represents, you know, sort of the current best evidence, adds observational data, shows in fact that there probably isn't a big difference, even though there's some statistically significant findings. The absolute magnitude of the difference is so small that the authors would recommend, you know, it's, the evidence suggests that there is no difference, and therefore if there's no difference, the cost of surgery in terms of complications is not worth it for the benefit and therefore non-operative treatment. Fair enough? Fair enough. Okay. And to, to, to be fair to the authors, they say non-operative treatment might be the preferred treatment for yeah. acute Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I, uh, fair yeah. enough. Okay, so now, how do we answer the question of uh, Kevin Durant? Non-operative treatment. So then he got surgery. Right. Was that correct? Huh, well, uh, I don't know the answer to that. And well, well, would this paper inform us on that at all? This paper would suggest that he may not benefit significantly. No, I, I can't say that. Okay, well, let's go back to one more quote. Yeah, let's go back up. Go up, go up, go up, right there. What does that say? 
It says, operative treatment is associated with complications inherent to the treatment itself, such as infection. However, athletic people may prefer operative treatment to, uh, I can't read that word, enhance, enhance and exp expedite their outcomes. Whereas a sedentary person yeah. with limited functional outcome expectations may prefer an operative treatment. Right. So that's completely a flip on what they've just said, everything prior. Right. And uh, so I'm not sure within this data set we see the outcomes in terms of, uh, s for instance, they say sensitivity analysis for the evaluation of weight-bearing status and accelerated rehab were performed. And there were no differences apparently in those. Uh, the primary analysis showed no significant difference in effect. Right. Yeah. So our outcome in terms of rehab or weight-bearing status was not, the only thing we were looking at is re-rupture rate. Right. So is a re-rupture in an athlete so much more expensive? Do you know, know what I mean? No, then, no, 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 because I see they've had the initial operation anyway. Right. If you don't have the operation, there's no expense. Right, right, right. And then they re-rupture, and then you have the operation, and then there's an expense. Right. What's the difference? Oh, no, I get, I get that point to, again. Yeah. But I, I, all I'm saying is that we, we tend to end up in the same place right. every time, which is the evidence is never absolutely... Um, sufficient to say we right. have an answer and so in this particular case you could look at this paper and say operative treatment clearly is the winner right. and in anyone who is um, in this case an athlete should get treatment and by the way um, we can make the argument that non-operative treatment really doesn't result in any meaningful um, difference from operative because the differences are so small to begin with and that is the challenge we're always left in right. and that is why we should always be, that is why we should always be focused on trying to understand individual studies. This is a good example of one that is yeah. so hyped up. But, but here's the point. Media's been saying everything out there, right? But generally speaking, the consensus was, you know, op no, one, no, one, no one went after anyone saying, well, you know, well, they did the wrong procedure. It was yeah. just assumed that an operation was going to get him back quicker. That right. was the assumption, right. and no one has challenged that. This paper, quite frankly, would suggest it may not necessarily lead to the best outcome, or better outcome over the longer term. Right. Or that outcome improvement may be so small it's indetectable, based on what we would think would be reasonable measures. Right. And then people are going to be coming to the clinics and saying, well, why, why, don't, why don't you operate on me? Right. Why don't you operate on me? Right. Why don't you operate on me? And, the, and this brings us right back to the point about what is this evidence-based medicine? Evidence-based medicine is the amalgamation of our clinical acumen, you know, how I can perform surgery, right. the best available evidence right. in things like this, but also what we can't forget is patients' preferences and values. Right, right. So the beauty of this is you can go into this data present it to your patient or your population and say, let's come up with our treatment together. Right. And, uh, as, and, and, and that's what you, you gotta do all the time, but that is the crux of evidence-based medicine um, in using this. And it's not just the, uh, the, the relying solely on this one systematic yeah, yeah, yeah. meta-analysis, et cetera. But that's why, you know, for patients who are coming in or listening to this as well, that's why it's worthy of having this discussion. Yeah. And for practitioners, you gotta have it. Right, and the truth is we've spent now probably an hour yeah. discussing one paper and yeah. one issue. And at the end of it, you don't come out feeling any more confident no. that you know the answer. I do not. Right, well, and that's the challenge with, with literature and the nuanced approach of literature and yeah. why it's so important really in many ways to understand it. Now we've gone through this because you know it's topical and it's of interest, but you know, we're still left in the same quandaries because yeah. of the same challenges. Until there's some big, large program of research that looks at many, many thousands of patients, yeah. uh, we're going to always be left with this uncertainty. So do you think we're going to get that, just as a final thing? I mean, your, I don't know. your, your, I don't know. I your don't platform know. on a well, lot of things is big data. Oh, no, is, for sure. Is it but, worthwhile? Well, the truth is, is that we have the capability to do it, and that always right. comes back to you know, individuals, investigators, all these trialists that did all these trials certainly, certainly have the capability of, of recruiting thousands of patients. It's a matter of coming together as a large network and they take time and energy yeah. and people who want to do it. So yes, anything is possible, but we have to first start with saying we can do it. Right. On that note, I think I will thank you 
Thank Dr. Petrizer, and we will continue on. We'll have you back again as we discuss, I'm sure, another interesting topic. Looking forward to it. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you.